and if you bat it away, I'm, I'm okay about that. <clears throat> the project we have is a fully commercial model. People expect market rates return, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. <clears throat> and when you work out all those costs, and it's also uh, a boot, so we have to, the investors who are uh, who come as commercial investors, we have to pay them back <coughs> their investment, uh, give them a return, etc. So it's quite expensive on money. <coughs> and consequently, we get a price for water at uh, 23 cents a cubic metre. What would be the price for the water if this scheme was run as a cooperative scheme? So that if the people who were putting it into it, all the farmers came up and said, we've got 104 yeah, we want 100 million dollars, 100, 100 million cubic metres of water. Uh, <clears throat> we're prepared to put the money in, and we will pay up front. Uh, and instead of taking the profit out of the dam, do what they do in South Canterbury, take the profit out of their farm. What would you estimate the cubic metre of water to be on that scenario? Um, yes, it is quite an unfair question to sort of do on the hoof. Um, and so that's not a piece of analysis yeah. we've done. I mean, well... Well, maybe you have. Well, no, I'm just going to do it in my head. I could be wrong, but um, I mean, if you if you say that they've pay if they pay for the dam up front, okay. yep. So you know, yeah. So that so the cost therefore is just the operating cost. Yep. So it is effectively 5.8 million less uh, sales from electricity. So it might be you know four and a half million something like that. But uh, you know divided by 104. So. I can't do that. <laughs> but effectively, that would be. I mean, so so we could come back to the price later on. Maybe we can solve that out for you. But you know, it, it wouldn't substantially, be that simple, though. No, no, no. Because you need yeah. they need a return as well. So they run them at absolute cost, rough on. Yeah. yeah. So it's just part of the farm infrastructure yeah. like you've got a It, it is academic. Yeah. All you do, I mean, it's the same number, it's just where it sits, yeah. basically. Yeah. So, um, and, and so, yes, so in terms of sort of them deducting from their farm profit a 23 cent charge, you know, they, they keep that, but they've had to fund $300 million. So, yeah. um, and, 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 but that's, that, that's the difference. Yeah. Have you, have you considered uh, contacting the Mana.com party about this? Um, no. Candidly, no. Uh, um, yeah. um, no. They don't have a phone. They don't have a quite, quite, quite definitively. They don't have a phone number yet. Yeah, I, no. th I think there's one. There is one important point to note with that, which is in all seriousness, <coughs> um, which, which is you know why Fenton says it's not academic is. If farmers were, well, yeah, sorry, is academic. But if farmers were paying for this out of their own money, they wouldn't be concerned with any of the environmental or economic benefits that flow from the scheme. So they would be looking at a different shape and look of a scheme which delivered water to their gate, and they wouldn't be interested in the other portions that get come from it. Uh, and therefore, the council wouldn't be involved at all, um, which is similar to the other schemes in the South Island. They generate. There's no question they generate generate economic benefit, but the reality is that you know it, it's focused on delivering water to a selection of farmers for the minimum cost. So therefore, any any of the environmental flows, all of those other bits that come alongside of it, all of that becomes not relevant to those investors in that. Except, that except to the extent they have to live by the rules that are yeah, laid down to, to in, relation get a consent, to right. in relation to those consents. Yeah. If we just follow up, I think it is important in that if, you, if I was a farmer and I was looking at paying 23 cents and inflation indexed for, for water per cubic metre, and I had the option of taking it at a much cheaper rate, then, it's not, <clears throat> then in the down years I don't have that amount of cash going out. I mean, I can manage that a lot better and manage the cost. So it becomes part of your, you, you manage your cost structure. But farmers, yeah. these farmers in this scheme do have that option because effectively they can hedge that risk by taking an investment in the scheme. So you'd actually get back to a zero-sum game between the two scenarios. And, Mr Chairman, if <coughs> the farmers are, are the owners under a cooperative, they have a, a cost of capital to make their, their contribution. Mm. Um, and, and you did the arithmetic on that. Mm. Cooperative option. 
<coughs> yeah. No. yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's right. So while they only have an operating cost, which is significantly smaller on a per cube basis, they have to finance that debt. So if they take and pay for the scheme, you know, you can do the maths, the capital cost divided by the um, number of hectares that will irrigate, that's how much uh, they have to borrow per hectare and they'll have to finance that on an ongoing basis with no let up from the bank regardless of the commodity cycle. And again, you know, you can almost get back to the point that that's indexed to inflation as well, that debt, because that debt must be repaid and the bank doesn't mind if you know, <coughs> the cycles go down, they'll keep coming and they'll sell your farm a few if you can't meet that repayment ultimately. So, you know, there's, there's a trade-off, it just goes both ways. You, you can reduce operating costs but you increase your debt charge. Yeah. And you wouldn't, be <coughs> you wouldn't be able to borrow at 5% or less. No. And, and, and inflation is built, in built into your interest rates anyway. Mm. So. Mm. So. Right. Thank you, gentlemen. Any other questions around the room? Uh, Councillor Graham. Page 43 on your paper you've given us. <coughs> I just... Um, and these aren't your figures, these are <coughs> figures that you've taken, that McFarlane land use assumptions. I, don't, I just don't understand the chart. Um, and, and there's a, uh, one comment I have um, on, um, I presume that's saying from on dairy, on light soils from 700 hectares to 8,000 hectares, is that correct? Am I reading that right? So, um, so I think if I point to that, I'll just describe to you what I see. So w what that says is the, the three columns on the left-hand side of that table. That's so current production? That's pre-storage, so before any scheme is contemplated. So that's, that's our understanding of right now, which points yep. to that number that people are familiar with, with which is around sort of 6,000 uh, hectares of irrigated today. And what those two columns say is... Well, of the total catchment area that we're considering, 36,000 is sitting dry and unirrigated, 6,000 is sitting and irrigated with a total of 42,000. And then the next three columns say post-storage, that, that's the assumption of the 25,000 hectares that you'd be familiar with, you know, and, and then effectively the, the portion and mix of how that splits between the land use um, over that, that pre- and post-storage. OK, I get that. So that's saying, um, according to McFarlane, if I get this figure right, tell me if I'm wrong, there are 3,400 hectares of orchards in Central Hawke's Bay at the moment? That's what they, yeah, that's... Well, mm -hmm. that's wrong. Okay. So that's a huge exaggeration of what reality is. So I, and that's just, this is... Um, I think the McFarlane report includes the whole catchment, including down... Well, part, I, if it? I may have it wrong, but the, uh, the way I'm reading this, this says there are 3,467 hectares of orchard in the Rua Tanifa today. Am I wrong? Okay. We, we can double check the numbers. That well, no, am I wrong that it's, I'm reading this wrong? That's what I'm saying. Am I reading that? No, you're not, no, no, not, no, not, not wrong. No. Well, the figure is wrong. Okay. The figure is wrong. So, you know... That just worries me when there's a wrong figure in here. How wrong is it? Well, thousand hectares if you're lucky. Three hundred percent. Okay. And the talky talky catchment. Well, in this catchment of forty-two thousand, whatever that footprint is, forty-two thousand. Right. There is not three thousand five hundred hectares of orchards. Still wrong. Hugely still wrong. I'm actually, uh, the biggest corporate um, uh, fruit grower down there would have 400, maybe 500 hectares, and they dominate. They're more than double everybody else. We can do two things. We'll, we'll check first that the number's been extracted from the McFarlane reports correctly. Could you check uh, that? And then secondly, if, it's, if it is corrected, we'll then we'll defer McFarlane. to McFarlane. But if, if that's right, what well, other figures are wrong? Hold all that up. Yeah. Let, so, let's. So just one thing wrong. Let, let them do their work. Yeah. That would be my view. I, I agree with that. But mm. so just yeah. to check one thing. Yeah. That's not going to do the job. 
Oh no! Obviously, we need to check the ta the, ta the table because mm. that sort of flows mm. through as you know into a range of other oh, okay. pieces of analysis. So. Yeah. Anything further, Councillor Grant, to follow that? Um, yeah. So um, so I'm quite interested in that um, dairy on light soils. Um, we're saying it's 700 hectares at the moment. I don't know anything about that uh, industry, so I'm not sure if that's right or wrong. Um, but we're saying that's going to 8,000 hectares. Um, you're Accountants, so you wouldn't be concerned about that, but I would be. From a nutrient, yeah. yeah and that's a different conversation, obviously. From yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Councillor Belford. Uh, just one quick item, which you or someone may be able to knock off the table here, but it's been a flurry of emails lately that that suggest. There could be a $30 million difference in the cost of the dam that the Board of Inquiry thinks it sanctioned and the type of dam that is actually now proposed to be built. Uh, uh, I'm not an engineer. I don't know the difference between a concrete-facing rock-filled dam and a, and a central core-filled rock-filled dam, but I'm told there could be a $30 million difference in the cost of those two, and the Board of Inquiry, uh, on the basis of quite a bit of evidence, said that it was happy to endorse this, what appears to be can, more expensive. Can we, get, can we get some clarity on that, perhaps from the back of the room? I, I, I would be reasonably confident you gentlemen wouldn't know anything no, about that. No, okay. no. <laughs> you is going to be, if it is a 30, to 30 million dollar difference, we haven't had is that a significant Implication to the rest of your spreadsheets here. Yeah, we, we we haven't had any information in relation to that. So, um, yeah. it's another thing you'd have to recalculate. It, it would be if if, if if that had changed, but obviously. What is the answer? Do, do you well? Let, let's put this to bed. Can someone come and have a go at that? Is that is that figure erroneous? Are we able to um, find out where yeah, the flurry of emails be have been to and from? Because none of us have ever seen it. Um, it's just, it's just people pointing me to the evidence presented no. uh, in the Board of Inquiry saying here is what we agreed to versus what is described in this document as the dam that will be built. There are two different products. All right, so you're talking about the conditions that have been imposed on the... Uh, uh, construction know. method, is that construction right? Construction method, right. Yeah. Okay. Can, can, can someone get back to us on that, or do you wish to attack, uh, give that a, a, a go now? Anyone here? Great. You happy to deal with it now? Thank you. <laughs> So, I'll explain the process here, and Graham will explain the dam type. The process is, is, we've been very clear about, is this. Is that in the DNC process, that's the design and construction process, we've run a competitive process between two consortia to design both the dam and distribution network. In that process, between HBRIC, uh, the other investors, uh, and, and, the, and the consortium themselves. We've done a significant amount of geotech work as part of that optimisation process. And uh, in that geotech work, it's a matter of going through the materials on the site, and Graham, you can get in, you can describe just that, that in broad terms uh, to end up with an optimised dam that meets the design specifications, the tectonic issues, all those sorts of things that needs to do so. so that process is under, was underway. Uh, in terms of the consenting process, consent application had what we called flex conditions, well identified in process with the board, which simply said that this is, this is a design criteria that, that may change along the way. Now the final point I'd simply make is clearly that we, have a, we, we, we had a competitive process whereby the two consortia did, were not given privy access to their own material, to the opposition's material for obvious reasons, because that's, that's a commercially confidential process. But we did absolutely clarify that we wanted innovation in that process and that's precisely what we've got. So um, Graham, and, and not only that, uh, it, the, it's not new 
uh, the uh, Central Core Rockford Dam has been, has been that that information's been sitting there in front of you for a while, actually. Okay, so Graham, you might just describe simply the the design criteria, etc. Around it. Yeah. Okay. And and look, I'm not sure. Perhaps Councillor Belford can uh, uh, highlight the issue about the thirty million dollar figure. That doesn't. Yep. Um, mean anything to me or make any sense to me, so perhaps some further explanation on that uh, would be helpful. But certainly, as, as, as Andrew stated, and again, it's been clear through the Board of Inquiry process and certainly through my evidence that you know, we were running these concurrent work programs. We have all the way through this particular uh, project or process, and um, dam type is obviously an issue we, we canvassed through the feasibility phase. We looked at all several um, dam type options through what was the Tonkin and Taylor phase, including. RCC roller compacted con concrete central core. There's there's five or six dam types that were on the table as we worked our way through feasibility. The CFRD dam was landed on through that process with the um, knowledge of the information we had at that time around the geotechnical conditions. So the money that we'd spent on the order of one one half million dollars associated with looking at what we understood of the site around materials, geotechnical and seismic conditions, and therefore what dam types would suit in that particular application. Again, through that concurrent process, HBRIC invested um, a sum of more money associated with the geotech and seismic issues. It was identified through the DNC competitive process. The one thing that the uh, two competitors were keen on was further knowledge or further work done in, the, in terms of the understanding of those geotech and seismic conditions. So concurrent with that competitive process, HBRIC invested another around the order of a million dollars looking at um, foundation conditions and material types. And through that process, and as is absolutely consistent with these big feasibility design processes, um, further information came to light about the, the uh, condition of the site. And again, that information, certainly through GNS and Tonkin and Taylor, was put into the Board of Inquiry process. Now, that highlighted some headaches for us or additional information around material type and quality of material, but it also reinforced and actually dealt with a range of issues around question marks around um, uh, fault features in particular. Um, a level of understanding around issues associated with seismic conditions. So some of those were moderated to the extent that, that uh, lessened our um, concerns and certainly uh, further um, developed our knowledge of the site with some areas and in other areas it created a few additional headaches for us, particularly around material types or, or the size of material for building a dam. Through that process, and as, as Andrew said, it was a confidential slash intellectual property issue between the two competitors. They went away, they took that feasibility design and were pretty much given carte blanche through that 20 week period to consider what they could do with that, uh, that design and cost to optimise the scheme. Now the preferred consortia has gone away and, and certainly confidential from us in actual fact went and, and um, did additional material testing, sourced material within that site that they could actually offer up a different dam type. So through, and, and I've indicated in terms of response to someone else, that um, evaluation period, particularly with our technical advisors, all of that information was considered as part of the decision about um, who we would select as the preferred consortia and what the final de dam design type would be. And that was um, undertaken as part of the uh, uh, recognising the flex conditions within the Board of Inquiry process that allowed us to do that. So. The issue we've had is obviously that's been happening concurrently with the Board of Inquiry process. It came out coincidentally at the um, um, coincidence with the uh, business case and the central core dam, which is associated with needing a flexible material in terms of how it operates. In fact, is considered to be a more appropriate and a safer dam in this particular instance where we've got seismic conditions. Now, that was, again, an expectation of feasibility. If we had those materials, that would be um, a preferred option. Uh, the testing at the time in the media era didn't show or, or demonstrate those materials, but one of the consortia have gone and found them in a location that are available and have been costed into the project, and hence have driven the cost of the dam as, as presented through that process. So, so that cost is accurate, is what you say? The, the, the challenge was 30 million less or 30 million more? No, no, no the, the, question, the question is really not that you may well have identified a better mousetrap. The issue is that when you when you read the Board of Inquiry decision, they go on for two pages citing evidence as to why the other, uh, the originally proposed structure was the 
correct one or the superior one, and that's the one they explicitly endorsed. So do you feel you have to go back to the Board of Inquiry and say, wait a minute, we have a, we have a different dam that we threw? No. no. Uh, that's the question, really. No, no. And can I make two points? Um, as you'll be aware, in the Board of Inquiry decision, uh, and this was in, in discussion with Hbrook, uh, we agreed to an independent advisory panel being part of the pro dam build assessment process. Okay, so that was that was dealt with at the time. Uh, it's ended up in the draft <coughs> consent. So that's that's the first issue. And the second issue, which I'll just repeat for everybody, is that this dam has to go through a dam build consenting process. Okay, so well, there's and, plenty of safeguards. And, and so, yeah. Additional to that yep. is that this any modifications of the design has to meet or exceed the current design dam safety expectations. So, so it has that minimum baseline of, of the feasibility of design. And just to then finish, I'll clarify that in terms of the capital cost data, what Alan and David have examined, that capital cost is two hundred and seventy five million dollars built dollars built through their numbers, which reflects the reflects the the, the actual cost. Yep. Okay. Yep.